Dolph Ziggler may very well go down as the most underrated wrestler in WWE history. He's been around for so long now that it's easy to forget just how good he is in the ring. Yes, at points he's even been compared to the likes of Shawn Michaels and Mr. Perfect, yet despite having all the skill in the world, the general perception is that he's never quite reached the same level of success, even if he is a multi-time former world champion at this point. So, how did all this come to be? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into his entire career journey so far in Show Off The Dolph Ziggler Story. Nicholas Theodore Nemeth was born in Cleveland, Ohio on July 27, 1980. From an early age, he was a fan of pro wrestling, with him attending his first event when he was just five years old. By the time Nemeth was 12 then, he had already decided that this was what he wanted to do with his life, and so, while at St. Edward High School, he started training in amateur wrestling, hoping that this would give him some of the skills he would one day need to segue into the pros. And as it turned out, amateur wrestling became a big success for the young Nick, and he ended up setting the school record for most pins held by any student during their time there. This despite the fact that he was on the same team as two future MMA and Olympic performers in Gray Maynard and Andy Rovat. By the time he reached college age, he continued to achieve success in the wrestling world, eventually setting the, at the time, record for most career wins at Kent State University at an impressive 121, going on from there to become a three-time All-Mid-American Conference champion. But it wasn't all athletics that was on the Ohio boy's mind at this point, because he also managed to get a degree in political science, with Nemeth even then getting accepted into the law school at Arizona State University, where he had planned to go before other opportunities came calling. Those opportunities, of course, would be in WWE, because in 2004, after seeing what he had achieved in the amateur world, the company began courting Nick, eventually signing him to a developmental deal later that year, and from there, sending him down to Ohio Valley Wrestling, where he would at first wrestle under his real name as he feuded with the likes of Paul Burchill and Ken Doan. And quickly impressing his bosses, he was called up to the main roster soon after, making his debut on the September 9, 2005 episode of Sunday Night Heat as the golf caddy slash personal enforcer for Chavo Guerrero Jr., who was then going by the ring name of Kerwin White. And after a few weeks of backing up White from ringside, Nemeth would finally make his in-ring debut as the two teamed up to take on Shelton Benjamin and Matt Stryker. Yeah, it was a pretty bad gimmick, but it seemed like, at the very least, it was going to give the former amateur wrestler plenty of opportunity to get on TV and show what he could do. Unfortunately, however, after the tragic death of Eddie Guerrero later that year, the Kerwin White gimmick was abruptly dropped, this leaving no place for the caddy incarnation of Nick in the company anymore. As a result of this then, he was sent back down to OVW while WWE tried to come up with something new for him. And this something would come right at the turn of the year as it turned out, because on the January 23, 2006 episode of Raw, the Spirit Squad made their debut. Now this gimmick, one in which all five members of the stable were presented as a group of male cheerleaders, might have been even worse than the last, as it was clearly designed mostly for comedy, and the entire team were regularly treated like hapless jobbers throughout their run. That said though, Nicky, as he was now being known, tried his best to work with what he had been given, and so, as the group spent their initial weeks on the roster doing cheers for Jonathan Coachman, he threw himself into it with everything he had, something which would become a recurring theme for him throughout his entire WWE run. Not long after this, and it looked like the effort the Spirit Squad were putting in to trying to get the gimmick over might actually be paying off, because they were recruited by Vince McMahon to help him take on D-Generation X throughout the summer of 2006, with Nicky and his teammates regularly getting main event exposure on TV during that time, while also getting to share the ring with Shawn Michaels and Triple H, soaking up all they had to teach them in the process. And while this feud was ongoing, the five-man unit would also become World Tag Team Champions briefly, each being able to defend the belts under the Freebird rule, with this making for Nemeth's first title run while on the main roster. Unfortunately though, the Spirit Squad's run would meet its untimely end later in the year, as they were soundly beaten by DX at both June 25th's Vengeance pay-per-view and July 15th's Saturday night's main event. 
Following this, they would lose their tag team titles to Ric Flair and Rowdy Roddy Piper at November 5th, Cyber Sunday, and from there would be obliterated by DX one more time on the November 27th episode of Raw. The last fans would ever see of the group, in fact, would be later that same night when, backstage, all five members were dumped into a crate with a stamp on it instructing them to be sent back to OVW in a joke for those in the know. After this, Nick did indeed return to OVW, making his re-debut on January 17, 2007 as he formed the Frat Pack with his former Spirit Squad stablemate Mike Mondo. There, they would work with the likes of Cody Rhodes and Sean Spears as the promotion transitioned things over to Florida Championship Wrestling, which would become WWE's new developmental system for the next few years. And it was after moving to FCW that Nemeth developed the new nickname The Natural, as he set out to prove that he was the best pure athlete on the roster by continually putting on excellent performances that frequently found him being compared to both Mr. Perfect for his excellent ability to take bumps and Shawn Michaels for his fantastic in-ring work. By 2008, he had tweaked the gimmick even further, changing his name to Nick Nemeth and forming a team with Brad Allen which would see both men become FCW Florida Tag Team Champions by the spring. And as April rolled around, Nemeth began once again being eased up to the main roster as he competed in a number of dark matches, eventually getting the formal call-up on the September 15th episode of Raw where he was repackaged as Dolph Ziggler, a cocky and vain heel who announced to the world that he was there to steal the show every night. The name Dolph Ziggler, while normal to wrestling fans now, sounded pretty ridiculous at the time of course, but it was actually one suggested by Nemeth himself, Dolph being his grandfather's name and Ziggler being something thought up by a friend of his. And while it was a mouthful, it certainly helped him stand out as, by December of that year, he would start racking up victories as he rose up the company's mid-card. By April 15, 2019, he would be drafted over to SmackDown and from there would make his debut on the blue brand just two days later, defeating United States Champion MVP in a non-title match. This was a major moment for Ziggler at the time as it showed the company saw him as a future player to be reckoned with and fans certainly agreed with them as, despite his heel character, they clearly enjoyed watching him, often popping for his great in-ring work. In the weeks that followed, he would initially try and win the US title, but he would be unable to do so, and from there, he would enter a feud with the Great Khali instead where he had the unenviable task of trying to make the Giants look good. Obviously, management were impressed with his ability to do this then because after that program concluded with Dolph getting the win at June 28th's The Bash, he entered into an on-screen relationship with Maria Kanellis and began battling with Rey Mysterio over the Intercontinental title. Sadly, he would never be able to defeat Mysterio for the belt though, and when the diminutive luchador lost it to John Morrison soon after, the show stealer would be unable to win it from him either. Looking back on it, this was one of the early warning signs of the inconsistent stop-start pushes that Ziggler would be subject to in the years that followed, a booking style that would see him at points look like he was ready to break out into superstardom only to have this snuffed out at the last minute as Vince McMahon changed his mind and moved to someone else. At this time, however, there was still the belief that Dolph could be the next big breakout star for the company, and so, after an impressive performance at the Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania 26, he dropped Maria and hooked up on screen with Vicky Guerrero, this union being enough to get him another shot at the Intercontinental title, then being held by future WWE Champion Kofi Kingston. That match would come on the August 6th episode of SmackDown and would finally see the Ohio native win a singles title when he pinned Kofi to become the champion for the first time. After that, he would spend the rest of the year successfully defending the belt in rematches against Kingston as well as against new challengers like Caval and Jack Swagger, all while continuing to build up a repertoire of excellent matches that just went further towards proving he was one of the biggest stars in waiting the company had at that time. Even when he lost the belt at the January 4, 2011 episode of SmackDown, he would bounce right back later that night by winning a fatal four-way match against Cody Rhodes, Drew McIntyre, and The Big Show to become the number one contender to the World Heavyweight Championship. Ultimately, when the time came for that title shot against Edge at the subsequent Royal Rumble pay-per-view, however, he would not be able to win, 
but would manage to get a forgotten world title reign a couple of weeks later when Vicky Guerrero was able to use her acting general manager powers to disqualify Edge during a rematch on the February 11th episode of SmackDown after he had used the spear, something she had banned for the bout. This allowed her to award the belt to Dolph on the following SmackDown. That was until Teddy Long, the actual GM, came out to give Edge another shot, one he would win to regain the title on the same night. After that, Long fired Ziggler and Guerrero, with both disappearing from TV until March 7th when they arrived on Raw. And now a full-time member of the Red Brand, the show stealer began working his way up the ranks, feuding with John Morrison and Trish Stratus in the lead-up to WrestleMania 27, where the dastardly duo would work alongside Laycool to take on, and ultimately lose to, the team of Morrison, Stratus, and reality TV star Snooki. From there, Dolph set his sights on winning a title again, and this would eventually happen for him at June 19th's Capital Punishment pay-per-view when he once again beat Kofi Kingston to this time become the United States Champion. This was followed by a series of title defenses against the likes of Jack Swagger, Alex Riley, and Zack Ryder, the latter of which would see Ziggler even get some mainstream attention when he was punched out by Hugh Jackman at the end of the match. This title run would go on for a full 182 days in fact, at which point Ziggler was ready to move up to the next level when he went on to beat WWE Champion CM Punk during a gauntlet match on the December 26, 2011 episode of Raw. The week after that, he would beat Punk again, though this time by countout, and then at the 2012 Royal Rumble, he would get one final shot at the gold, however, would ultimately be unable to end Punk's record-breaking reign. What he would be able to do though was win the Money in the Bank contract during the titular ladder match that July, earning him a shot at the company's top prize at a time and place of his choosing. From there, he would spend much of the next year teasing cash-ins on both the WWE Champion and the World Heavyweight Champion, though always either being foiled in the end or instead choosing to play mind games and bide his time. And while he was doing this, he was also getting involved in a summertime feud with Chris Jericho, as Ziggler began goading the legend, claiming that he had lost his touch and was no longer the man he had once been. This resulted in a series of matches between the two, with the latter actually seeing Y2J be fired from the company after losing to the Money in the Bank contract holder on the August 20th episode of Raw as per a pre-match stipulation. From here, Dolph would move on to a lengthy program with Randy Orton, and then after that would begin going after the franchise player John Cena in an attempt to establish himself as the best WWE had to offer. This beef began when the show stealer and Vicky Guerrero both attempted to defame Cena by claiming he was having an affair with AJ Lee, something which would lead to a match between the two men at December 16, 2012's Tables, Letters, and Chairs pay-per-view where, to the shock of everyone watching, AJ cost Big Match John the win, joining forces with Ziggler and becoming his on-screen love interest, replacing Vicky in the process. Soon after this, and Big E Langston was also added to the unit, with him serving as the silent heavy. But he had his work cut out for him in that respect, because Dolph and AJ's issues with John Cena weren't over quite yet. In fact, he would seek his revenge in the weeks that followed, even at one point stopping his rival from cashing in the Money in the Bank contract against the Big Show on an episode of Raw. The feud between the two parties clearly had to come to an end before any of them could move on then, so on the January 14, 2013 episode of Raw, the whole thing was finally blown off once and for all in a steel cage match, which Ziggler would unfortunately lose. Still, he had the Money in the Bank contract to keep him from getting too sad about this and would continue to tease cash-ins over the next couple of months, with fans by this point expecting he was waiting to do so on the biggest possible stage at WrestleMania 29. On that night, however, he didn't end up doing this. Instead, he and Big E challenged Team Hell No for the WWE Tag Team Championships, and after losing the match, it seemed to some that he had missed out on his big moment. How wrong they were then, because the next night on Raw, in front of WWE's most raucous crowd in years, Ziggler came out after World Heavyweight Champion Alberto Del Rio had defeated Jack Swagger and Zeb Coulter in a handicap match to cash in on him, taking advantage of his weakened state and pinning him in mere minutes to finally become the champion as the fans exploded in what remains to this day one of the loudest pops of the modern era. 
This truly felt like a star-making moment for Dolph, as right in that moment, he was treated like someone who would surely go on to be a major player in the company's main event scene. Of course, he'd always had the talent for this spot, but it wasn't until this particular night that he finally reached a level of overness otherwise saved for the likes of CM Punk and John Cena. Sadly though, this title run and main event push would end up getting cut short when he suffered a concussion just a few weeks later on an episode of SmackDown, this causing him to be pulled from TV for the next month. When he did return, it seemed like the notoriously fickle Vince McMahon had changed his mind on Ziggler, perhaps now believing him to be injury prone as he had him drop the belt back to Del Rio at June 16th's payback. It must have been disappointing for sure, but if there was any solace to be found in that night, it was that the show stealer finally turned babyface officially after the loss as he continued to team with AJ Lee and Big E. Unfortunately for them though, that union was also on its dying embers as it turned out because after AJ inadvertently cost her man a chance to win the world title back at the following month's Money in the Bank pay-per-view, Dolph dumped the Divas champion, causing her to set Big E on him as the trio ended up settling things in a tag team match at August 13th SummerSlam that also included AJ's former teammate Caitlyn. After that, he moved back down to the mid-card as over the course of the rest of the year, he was unsuccessful in his attempts to win the United States title from Dean Ambrose and the Intercontinental title from Curtis Axel. So low did his stock fall during this time that at WrestleMania 30, he was relegated to the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. In fact, it wasn't until November 2014's Survivor Series that there was another brief upswing for the show stealer, as on that night, he ended up being the last remaining member of Team Cena during their 5-on-5 five -five battle with the Authority, even ending up winning the whole thing as he overcame 3-on-1 odds and got the rub from Sting in the process, who had debuted at the end of the match to help him get the final pinfall. This instantly gave fans hope again that the supremely talented Ohio boy was going to get another main event push and maybe even this time, a proper run with the world title. Sadly though, none of that would come to pass, because instead, he was dropped right back down to the position he'd been milling around in before, as it became clear Vince McMahon had no plans for him. And it was around about this time that many fans began to give up on him too, the constant 50-50 booking and stop-start pushes leaving them to finally realize that he was never going to go anywhere in the company. It was a sad state of affairs given what Ziggler could have been if given the opportunity, but instead, throughout the early months of 2015, he was used as a utility player in multi-man ladder matches and elimination chambers, though it never got treated as a real threat during them. What was meant to be his next big program after this didn't help matters much either, because after he acquired the services of Lana from her on-screen client and real-life boyfriend Rusev, a feud predictably broke out between the two men. Unfortunately though, this feud ended up getting scrapped before it could reach its climax after the company, angry with the Bulgarian brute and the ravishing Russian for revealing their real-life engagement to the public, dropped the whole thing prematurely. After that, Ziggler slipped even further down the pecking order, with him doing almost nothing between then and July of 2016, at which point he was drafted over to SmackDown where he quickly became number one contender to Dean Ambrose's WWE Championship even getting a chance to challenge him for it at that year's SummerSlam. By this point though, few believed Ziggler to be a real contender anymore, and so when he lost that match, no one was really surprised. That said, when he put his career on the line to get one last shot at the Intercontinental title just a couple of months later, eventually beating The Miz to win the strap that night, fans still got behind him in droves as he held the belt above his head, showing that even at this point, if treated correctly, he could be a star. But as you can probably guess by now, that didn't happen, and so after doing little of consequence again for the next year, he began to tease leaving WWE, which, given the fact that his contract was running out, led some to believe that he would be best served by doing what the likes of Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley had done before him, build a name for himself elsewhere, and then come back to the company refreshed. People even began wondering what it might be like to see the show stealer appear in the G1 or show up in Ring of Honor, but in the end, none of this would come to pass, as he would choose to re-sign with WWE, reasoning that while he may not be at the level he could be, he was comfortable getting a nice paycheck and being afforded the freedom to carry out his outside endeavors like stand-up comedy, something he had begun a few years prior and was by then regularly getting bookings for. 
Since then, he's continued to be a fantastic, if still underutilized, wrestler who has helped to get the aforementioned Drew McIntyre ready for the main event picture, as well as having some very underrated matches against the likes of Seth Rollins and Kofi Kingston. From there, his focus has been in the tag team division, where he's teamed with Bobby Roode to give some much needed life to this often neglected part of WWE. In fact, as the Dirty Dogs, Ziggler and Roode have managed to, at different times, become both Raw and SmackDown tag team champions over the last year or two, the latter of which they still hold as of the time of this video's recording. Where he goes from there is anyone's guess, but even if he never gets another shot at being the world champion, Dolph Ziggler can rest easy knowing that he's one of the best performers WWE has produced in the last 20 years, and certainly one of the most underrated. No, he may never hold the title above his head again, but rest assured, he'll always be there to steal the show when needed. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow WrestleWithAndy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.